Hello everyone and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. In today's video we're going to continue our series on large language model fundamentals using the LLM science exam competition on Kaggle as a proving ground to try out some different ideas. So in the previous video we looked at using a off-the-shelf base language model as a classifier um, to solve these multiple choice questions. These are science related multiple choice questions um, and so we didn't do any training. Today, I'd like to look at, well, what if we do want to do some training, um, but the 200 example questions that they provide aren't enough data to work with. And so this is going to be um, following on a similar idea to that by my good friend Radek, who has created 6,000 high quality training examples. Um, so I'm going to show um, a similar way to how he created it, I, I believe, um, but then also talk about some ways to extend that beyond just relying on OpenAI to generate the data. So this data that he's created is really nice. This is 6,500 examples of very similar types of questions to the examples in the competition, where you have a question, four possible answers, or five possible answers in this case, one of them marked as correct. Um, and these are based on scientific Wikipedia articles. So what, what, what we're gonna do is a little bit different. I'm gonna simplify things. I'm not gonna do an entry that's for the competition. I'm just gonna show the more general idea of we have some raw data, right? Like say Wikipedia articles, and we'd like to turn this into structured data to maybe train a task specific model down the line. Um, and so I fired up a notebook just locally on my machine using my OpenAI API key to start with. Um, just to illustrate how we might, if we wanted to, use one of these large available APIs for language models to create some data, which is going to be a starting point. Um, and so in this case, I am pulling a random extract from Wikipedia, not a science related article, just a random article. And we're going to use GPT 3.5 through the API to generate some initial questions. Um, and I'll explain why um, I'm doing this and why we might not necessarily want to rely on this for the final product. Um, okay, so similar to what we saw in the last lesson where we were practicing um, different ways of calling this API when we were building our baseline, you can just prompt a system message and a uh, user message and hope for the best with your answer. And so you can see here, a system message, create a multiple choice question with four possible answers. I'm feeding in a random Wikipedia extract and hoping that the data comes back in the format I'd like, which is a multiple choice question. And that's what it does. Um, but if you look at how the prompts are, are formatted or the results are formatted, if we were to run this again, we wouldn't necessarily get that same exact structure. Um, although in this case, it does seem to do it fairly well. Um, but if we want to be sure that it's going to follow an exact schema, we can use the function calling API, where we specify a function. In this case, I've called it create question, and we can define what parameters that function takes. So here a question, an array of answers, each of which is going to be a string, and then the correct answer. And so now by forcing this function to be called and making all of these parameters required parameters, we can kind of enforce that particular structure on the response. Um, now all of this prompting and descriptions would need to be um, tweaked to get the kind of question and wording that you would like. Um, again, you'll see here the, the examples that it produces aren't quite like the ones in the competition. So this by itself is not necessarily gonna be particularly useful. Um, but the nice thing with using this function calling API is that we get back this lovely JSON object that we can pass into a dictionary and we have the question answers and correct answer in this um, sort of pre-specified format, right? I have my context that I'm feeding in. That's the random Wikipedia snippet. I get back a question related to that context, four possible answers and a letter for what the correct answer is. So we can run this multiple times and that's going to give us a set of um, initial data that we can use. Now, the reason I mentioned that this is not necessarily always the best choice is that there are terms in OpenAI's terms of service that say you can't actually use the model to generate data, which is then going to be used to train a model to compete with them. Now, that's very broad. You, your model might be a very task specific model that isn't going to be competing with OpenAI. Um, it also is the case that maybe someone else uses GPT 3.5 to create some data. You train on that. That's not very clear if that's covered by the terms of service. But more generally, I know some people might want to avoid, for example, feeding in um, sensitive company information into the API, or there might be some other reason why you don't want to rely on this pre-existing model. Um, and so I'm using it here to create these initial examples, but I'm also just creating a fairly small set of examples such that this is something that you could also curate manually. Like you could write a few hundred demonstration questions with answers. You could get you know some interns to whip that up if you have that luxury. Um, so we're assuming here that we have some um, nice 
high quality data in the structure that we want, either generated from one of these paid APIs, like we just showed, or manually created. And now what we'd like to do is we'd like to take these 300 or 1000 um, initial examples, and we'd like to grow that into a much larger training set, because the more data we have on this task specific um, demo, the likelier it is that we can train our own model on that data. So the bulk of this video is going to be saying, okay, this is great. You can use GPT to generate synthetic data. Cool. How do I generate more data from that? And maybe how do I do that locally without uploading my data to some third party? Um, and how do I make sure that that's still fairly high quality? And so we're going to talk through how we build that kind of data flywheel. Um, just ending off here, the last thing I did when I was creating this data is I created a final text column that has all of those separate columns merged together into a set format. Um, this is the kind of expected format for any data set that you're training using the default um, fine tuning scripts for these language models. It's not going to have multiple columns and support for these different things. So I'm just formatting those together into a set prompt where I have the context, the question, four possible answers, and then the correct answer. And so I'm going to grab these different columns, merge them all together. Now I have this one single text column, and that's all I'm going to use for future fine tuning. So I can save that and I can push that to the hub. Um, this data sets up in the hub, the Hugging Face hub, if you'd like to try it. Um, and so now we're going to talk about the next step in this process. So we've generated some high quality initial examples. Um, the key technique that I want to highlight here is that, especially with parameter efficient fine tuning, um, you can train a language model to follow that format pretty well without that many samples, a few hundred samples or a thousand samples if you've got lots of time. Um, and we'll see how you can then use that to generate more, feed those back in. Um, and especially in a case like this where you have some context, right, some, some input from the outside world, um, we can create a nice reinforcing loop where we're continuously creating more and more high quality data. And we don't need that fancy of a language model to be able to use that context. It's a different thing to be able to ask questions out of the blue, um, but to be able to ask a question based on the context, that seems like a doable task. Um, so I can share this um, notebook, but to be honest, it's probably not even necessary. I followed a couple of references, which I'll include in the description of this video. And then I just simply ran the provided um, SFT trainer script that comes with the TRL library. Now the TRL library has recently been integrated into Hugging Face. Um, it was just a, um, I think a passion project of one of the engineers there. And what this does is it allows you to train a language model without relying on full fine tuning. You're not training every single parameter. Um, because in that case, you'd need much more compute power. Instead, you're using something called LoRa, low rank adapters, um, which is integrated in this um, PEFT library, Parameter Efficient Fine Tuning. Lots of acronyms, but long story short, this is a technique that allows you to rapidly and um, compute efficiently fine tune a language model without having to train the whole thing. Um, and we can feed in a data set as long as it has a text column. We don't have to change anything and it's gonna to learn to mimic that text. It's not gonna follow any structure um, guaranteed, but it is gonna learn whatever patterns are in the text that you feed it. Um, it's gonna to learn to try and follow those examples. So I've run the example script that took about half an hour. Um, and now we're gonna look at um, loading the resulting model, um, which you can see some examples of how to save that model, um, push it to the hub, etc. cetera. Um, we're gonna load that model and we're going to now apply it to generating even more data. Um, so I, I'm here now in the collab where we're actually going to be doing some running some code. Um, I have this random extract set up to pull a random extract from Wikipedia, just like when we were generating the original data. And what I've done is I've formatted this as the start of a string where we have the context, which, which includes the extract. And then the beginning of, if you look back at how I formatted the text column, we have context question, the four possible answers and the correct answer. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating some text where if the language model was fine tuned successfully to follow that same um, structure each time, hopefully it should auto complete this with a reasonable question four reasonable answers and then the correct answer as a label. Um, so now if I load that model, um, I'm not going to rerun just because it takes a little while. Um, the nice thing is the, um, the parameter efficient fine tuning results in a much smaller um, adapter, set of adapter weights, you don't have a whole new copy of the model, you just have this lightweight, um, nice and, you know, two megabytes of data to download over and above the, um, the base model. Um, so we can load that in. And then if I grab a prompt that looks like this, right, question, um, colon, and then that's the end of the prompt. 
and I auto generate from that, like I have the model complete tokens after that point, what I'm hoping is that we'll see um, four answers, A, B, C, and D, and then the correct answer. Now, we, we don't tell the model what the end of that question looks like. I maybe should have added an end of, end of question token or something where we could stop sampling. So it carries on and completes some additional um, fluff, but it seems to have followed the structure that I set um, fairly accurately. So we can now write some processing where we're going to take that string, we're going to split it based on that separation character that I included in the prompt. Um, we're going to check that there's at least um, the expected number of different strings, check that they each match the right start, context, question, order, etc. So just some basic sanity checking. Um, but it seems like when we process these outputs, we do in fact get exactly what we want. We split it back into the context, the question, four possible answers, and a label of what the correct answer is. Now you can see here, this isn't just the letter A, so we're probably going to want to do some additional filtering, right? Maybe I can just um, include a little bit of processing there. Um, but one way or another, we can, we can wrangle that string into the format that we like. And as long as we include some um, additional checking, um, we should be able to get some fairly, fairly high quality data from this. So I've just run this 10 times. You'd obviously run that um, a lot longer. And there's all sorts of optimizations you can do to improve the speed. Um, but for simplicity here, I've just run it a few times. So we've got a data frame now of the lightly processed question, possible answers, answer pairs. And you can see not all of these follow the format that we'd like exactly. Right? Some of them have some text after the colon. Um, and so we can fix that. We can fix that with some processing. We can apply a function to trim off anything after the first character in the correct column. We can check that the um, column only contains one of the four possible answers. Um, and then we can save those samples. Now, something to note, this, this fine tuning is not perfect. This is a, a much smaller base model than GPT 2.5. Um, and it might also just have some quirks into how it learns how to follow that kind of structure. In this case, one thing that it's learned is to often put the correct answer first. Again, something that you can fix if you're aware of it, just be, be aware that there might be quirks in patterns that it finds that maybe you don't want if it's overfit. Um, and so we're going to look at, um, in this case, this is quite easy. You could just shuffle the columns, but more generally, um, we want to think how do we validate that this data is actually doing what we want. So there's a few ways. One, which I'll leave as an exercise to the reader, is to lean back on one of those larger models. Um, remember I said there's a clause that says you can't use it to generate data to train rival models. Um, a lot of people are interpreting that that says, okay, I can't have the GPT outputs be something that I train on, but I can use it to filter my own model outputs. Um, so you could use the function calling API like we did before to have a, um, like a validate question function that says, um, you know, do I accept this question or do I reject it? If I reject it, why? Maybe there's duplicate answers, maybe there's incorrect answer or weird formatting. Um, but the way that I wanted to highlight, which again is something that um, is maybe not something that occurs to you, but it's, it's relatively easy to implement, is that we can just manually filter this data. Um, if you're used to dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of samples, it might seem completely infeasible to manually review them. But remember, we're talking about parameter efficient and data efficient fine tuning. We start with 500 examples, we train a model, we generate 2000 more samples. Um, going through 2000 examples doesn't actually take that long. And so if you're willing to sit there, you can get a much higher quality in your data set just by manually filtering. And so here I have a function to display some text one row at a time from the data frame. I have a function to label that text, which is going to have either accept or reject. And if I choose accept, it's going to save that onto the end of a new um, CSV file. And I'll just make sure that's not there already. Yep. Um, so it's going to create this file if it needs to be created and then keep adding on to that. And then a simple little Gradio interface where I have the text that I'm going to be reviewing and then two buttons, accept or reject. Now you can make this much more complicated. You can add, you know, special label categories for types of errors and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to highlight how simple and easy it can be to manually review some data. So you can see here, I've got my context that's pulled from Wikipedia. I have my question. I can check that the answers seem fairly reasonable. Um, accept. I have some context. All of these answers look like they're the same, so I'm going to reject that. I have my context, my question. Um, okay, it seems like B is the correct answer. Here, there's some formatting, but maybe you're able to deal with that um, in post-processing, and so on. So we go through, we accept a few more, 
uh, maybe let's reject the rest just to make sure that we are able to reject um, and so on and once that's done um, we can view the results so let's assume we've we've labeled them all we run our CSV files view the filtered um, and so you can see here okay I should have added um, index equals false when I was saving <laughs> um, but I have a very um, very malformatted <laughs> data frame. I should have, I guess, checked my code before I ran it live on video. Um, but you can see we do have the important part here. We do have context question, four possible answers, and the correct answer, um, and only for those rows where I clicked accept. So I've managed to implement some very basic filtering with a very minimal interface. Obviously, you can improve this um, dramatically, make it much easier to read, and so on. Um, but yeah, basically the whole point of this video is to highlight that you can have this virtuous cycle, right? Where you start with some initial examples, either hand curated or um, manually like written out. You um, use that as your initial set of examples to train a model. And then you use that to generate more samples. You use filtering somehow to remove any low quality samples. You then now have a slightly larger data set of quality examples. So you feed that through, you train a model, you generate more samples, you filter them, you now have even more quality examples and so on. You can repeat this a few times. I've seen people starting from very few examples and doing this very quick fine tuning. Um, and it doesn't take many repeats of this to end up with a model here that you've trained that's able to generate a lot of good, da good data. And so hopefully within a fairly short period of time, you're able to end up with something like this where you do have a much larger data set of high quality training examples that you can now use to train your task specific model. And that is what we'll look at in the next video. For now, I hope this has inspired you and let you know that you can indeed create your own synthetic data um, using this virtuous cycle that we've talked about. It's not too hard. Um, yeah, so if you do try this, let me know. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next one.